I mean, it's like, if we think about, if we think about what, you know, we'll, let's just use the word, we'll just think about sexism, yeah? Or we'll think about patriarchy. If men had to do the work to run patriarchy, it, would be, it wouldn't be worth it for us. <laughs> the point of patriarchy is that women do most of the fucking work to oppress themselves. I mean, for real. Sure, there's always explicit cases where dudes clearly terrorize, dominate, try to take everything they can from women's rights, but for the most part, you know, the daily quotidian capillary practices of patriarchy tend to be shouldered by women. And the same thing happens with white supremacy. I mean, if you, look, if you took every single fucking white person on the world, the world and voted them off the island, we would run white supremacy perfectly without them. <laughs> oh no, we would. Motherfuckers would be like, I need light in my skin. You look too chinky, I'm not. You know, I'm fucking lighter than you that I'm not. I think that the, the, when the idea of white supremacy being somehow the sole possession of white people is absurd. If white people had to white, run white supremacy, they, they can't even fucking mow their own lawn. How the fuck are they going to run white supremacy? I mean, they got us so caught up in doing it. Listen, I don't know. I love the fucking, you know, like every, but every immigrant who gets a passport, you either like can't travel, don't want to, or you're kind of obsessed with travel. You're trying to kind of reproduce this. Every time I go to a new country, I always go look at the skin lightening creams. <laughs> I have yet been to a country that doesn't have an entire wall of skin lightening cream somewhere. And I'm telling you, I went to the fucking Philippines and literally there is fucking more skin lightening cream there than liquor and them motherfuckers like liquor. <laughs> Santo Domingo, Santo Domingo, like if ever there was a run on skin lightening creams in the world, Santo Domingo could ship it out and supply the rest of the planet. <laughs> We'd be like, we will give you the Sammy Sosa treatment for life. <laughs> so, when we think about this, it's, I think that often, often we forget or we tend to simplify these processes and we think that they're somehow, they pool around certain populations. But that's not the way hegemonic forces work. They can't work that way. They're like a hydra. You know like that, that fucking monster with the many heads? The thing is, is the heads, it's, there's one in each one of us. And it's, it's really kind of shocking. It's one of those things where I always think, my community, I, I never understood why the South Africans fought so hard for apartheid the way they did. Because if simply South Africans had just picked up and relocated to South America, they could have had an apartheid regime that nobody would ever have complained about. I mean... That's what Latin America is, a series of apartheid regimes that we just kind of explain away because we think it's, oh, it's these oligarchies. This is one of those extraordinary moments where clearly, clearly, the, there are real social impact in the increasing inequality in this country. In the 80s, when I was in high school, a kid like me from a poor ass neighborhood on welfare, on Section 8, single mom raising five kids on $6,000 a year. Yeah? When I was in high school, me against a private kid from up the road in Lawrenceville. Lawrenceville was a private high school right outside of Princeton. Yeah? Me versus them, I could still fuck those kids up. <laughs> no, like, I could study enough to compete with them. Because the gap between us wasn't as enormous. Right now, the average public high school kid has absolutely no chance. It's like one in a billion. You've got to be an incredible person to be able to compete because the disparities have become enormous. These kind of segregations and these disparities are nothing new, but their horrific violence and the extremity of it, I mean, and you know, in New York City, people go to New York City and they're like, New York City's so mixed. Well, the truth of the matter is that the average black and Latino person in this country, as in the United States, the average black and Latino person, despite what hip-hop videos might tell you, <laughs> lives in a more segregated reality than they lived in 1970. And, as you know as well as I do, we would never know this, because they've dismantled anything that could possibly teach us this. I mean, how many fucking ethnic studies programs have there left? 
All the programs that actively would teach us this shit, they're like, we're going to get rid of you. You know? So, no, I hear you. But I guess what I mean is that, like, this is what we would call in the U.S., there's like a soft apartheid. The contradictions of U.S. capital is that there's such a ferocious competition that one of the weird contradictions of American capitalism is that the competition is so ferocious that occasionally someone from down bottom can just knock it the fuck out. In Latin America, that capitalism doesn't have the same contradictions. People who are really poor stay poor forever. They stay poor forever. And so, I just always thought they should have moved to fucking Bolivia and called it a day, you know? And none of us would have said anything. Because we don't fucking say anything about it now. I go to the Dominican Republic, them motherfuckers have been on that island for 500 years and they're still blonde. <laughs> Do you know the kind of force, social force it requires for a motherfucker to stay blonde inside the Domingo? <laughs> like, I mean, Hitler would be proud. That motherfucker would be like, Diablo, well done. 